I'm walking to remember, to pay tribute, to pray, and to ask for God's healing in our country. This trail is a living example of the brokenness in our world that still exists today. It was a forced removal of the Potawatomi Nation from northern Indiana to Kansas. The 660 miles, I'll be prayer walking along the trail of death over the next 21 days tracking where they walked across the Midwest. I've invited some friends along with me that have some inspiring stories of redemption in their own lives. And I believe from hearing these stories, we can learn how we can break through the sins of our past and experience healing. To the person who's received injustice, half recompense is, is not recompense. I can't even explain how much God has sustained in the midst of one of the hardest earthly things for a, a, a parent to experience. I mean, just in America, if people aren't good at acknowledging what has been done in the past. If we can have this understanding that is not just being able to forgive, but have a level of compassion, it's going to breed a lot of wholeness moving forward and the ability to reconcile. You can't take God's song away from a people. We're all adopted into God's family, but as the people of God, we get to adopt everyone else, you know, into that same family. This is the fullness of Christ on the earth. This is what the body of Christ is meant to be. Our stories from our past are so important. What we inherit if we don't allow God to transform that brokenness, we will transmit that to the next generation. So we need to understand our brokenness so that God can heal us and we can pass on healing to the next generation. Well, welcome to the Thought Factory podcast. We are in our ninth season as a podcast. We are so excited for you to join us in listening to it. If you have not listened to the last week's episode, it was in regards to our response to COVID-19 and how we have responded as an organization personally, but also there's some nuggets there for a youth leader, a youth pastor, or even a parent in how to react or or some insight into the time period that we find ourselves in. So I encourage you to check that episode out. The rest of the season, there are a number of episodes that will be centered around the student or the youth minister, whether it's a youth pastor or a youth worker. And we wanted to get their insight in what's happening as well in the world, in their culture, whether it's in school or in their youth ministry, and just getting their perspective of their response to the coronavirus and this pandemic that we find ourselves in, and just how things have changed, what trends are happening, the, the result of just being completely shifted in normalcy. And so we want to just continue to encourage you to join us for this season. It's gonna be exciting, it's gonna be fun. We're going to hear directly from students and youth ministers throughout the season. Today, our episode is centered around what you have heard in the intro in regards to uh, what we call the trail of death. And Jeff uh, took a personal journey to prayer walk this, this trail of death. And we are going to kind of do something different. Sometimes we bring a guest into the studio and interview them, or we have a phone call and we interview an expert in regards to a certain topic. And But today we are going to 
hear directly from Jeff, and I am going to interview him uh, in the studio. So Jeff Eckert, welcome to the studio. Good to be here, Jason. Yeah, thank you. I am going to be kind of just asking you your experience, the, some questions to get the audience to understand what you went through. Because it wasn't just an adventure that you went on. It wasn't just, hey, you went for a few weeks and walked and, and prayed. There was some significant things that happened to you, some th things that you were praying about that is much larger than you or our organization. We just thought in this episode, we could take some time and hear directly from you what you experienced and the significance of the trail of death and why were you drawn to even walking it? And so for the context and for our audience to understand, tell me what the trail of death is and, and how did you first hear about it? The trail of death was a forced removal of Potawatomi Native Americans that tried from Northern Indiana to Kansas and it happened between September 4th and November 4th of 1838. So th that was the time when European settlers in North America were moving westward and in their way of progress, so to speak, was what they referred to, quote unquote, as the Indian problem. And they were trying to figure out what to do. And so uh, similar to a lot of people have heard of the Trail of Tears, the Trail of Death is a, a similar idea where these Native Americans were round up one night and moved from Indiana to Kansas. And I heard about it because a mentor, professor, a friend of mine walked it back in 2006. And it was probably a year or two after that. I remember hearing about it and he wrote a book about it called Walking the Trail of Death. And his name was Keith Drury. And it intrigued me a little bit because I've always been connected to Native Americans because of some of my bloodline from the past. I have a great grandmother who's full-blooded Cherokee Indian. And also my dad was very, what I would say dialed into that whole issue. He was very broken and mentioned it often. My dad's no longer alive, but for those of you that have someone from your past that's no longer around that you can talk to, but if you remember recurring conversations or themes, you, you begin to understand how important it was to them. And I've, Realized that more as time has gone on. My dad talked about Native American things a lot. He was personally really and emotionally tied to a lot of these things. So it came up again in 2017 because when we had planned to have Claim Your Campus 2020, which was this gathering where we were, um, you know, praying and and believing that 100,000 students would be gathering on this field in Kansas for July 4th weekend of the summer of 2020. When we chose the location for that event, we chose it in 2017, and we chose it in Kansas, and there's a story behind that that's kind of long, but God really clearly directed us to, to go to Kansas to do this event, and not long after we chose that location, the trail of death came into my radar again and enough so that I looked into it a little bit more than I'd done in the past and I realized that the trail of death starts in northern Indiana in a little town called Plymouth and it ends in a little town in Kansas called Osawatomi and here's what stuck out to me it stuck out to me that Plymouth Indiana is where I lived my wife and I lived in the mid to late 90s I was a youth pastor in this little town in northern Indiana, Plymouth. It's where our first daughter was born. thought that was kind of interesting, but then even more so was that where the trail ended in Kansas was just a few miles from where we were going to hold this event. Osawatomie, Kansas was just a few miles from Lacine, Kansas, where we were hosting Claim Your Campus 2020, our event for July 4th weekend. And so because of that, I started thinking about it again. And then an idea started to form to maybe walk it between Indiana and Kansas. Out of knowing it, out of the years of hearing about it and researching it, what was the decision in your mind, in your heart, to ultimately make you want to walk the trail of death? I, from, from 2017, starting there, I began, it, it started off as an idea and that's kind of how God works. I think in my heart is an idea will come to mind. And then 
I ran it past just a handful of people. One of the one of the persons was Nigel Big Pond, who he and I are on the National Day of Prayer board together. He's an elder statesman in many ways. He's seventy years old. He's uh, Native American, fourth fourth generation minister, amazing man. And I started to talk to him about this, and he started to help me understand it. And I talked to Keith Drury about it. But it started off as an idea. Jason, you and I, for going back 15, maybe almost 20 years, we've done many adventurous things together. And this started off as kind of an idea that was a little adventurous. But as I thought about it more and more, I realized the level of difficulty, but also the level of intensity it would take to do it between giving up the time and the planning and everything. And But as time went on, it became more of an idea and it transferred into what I would call a calling to do it. Then I sat down and tried to figure out how I could do this trail of death walk before July 4th of 2020. And knowing that it was an adventure in the beginning and there was this thought of just going for a walk, but as it started to transform into almost this purposeful, calling into I can't help but do this how do you prepare for not just an adventure but also the heart of it we have a a video crew that has followed you so there's there's people involved there's interviews there it developed into a much larger thing than just you walking for a few hundred miles how did you prepare for this experience it was crazy because Beginning late 2017, I actually would put on my calendar. I would set, I would mark off and block off a few weeks to do it. And at first I thought I'm going to do it in 40 days. And I talked to some people, talked to Keith Drury who walked it and others. And then I wasn't able to do it for several reasons, mainly logistics and timing. And so then I'd, you know, that block of time would just get eaten up by other things or just didn't work. So then I would block off in 2018 another point in time and then that didn't work and then another one in late 2018 then I did that throughout 2019 and when we got to 2020 uh, believe it or not the first weekend of February before COVID and everything happened I was still trying to figure it out how can I do this before July 4th and it felt this calling it made it feel like I need to do this it was somehow connected to July 4th in our event like I needed to complete this first and it I couldn't really explain to anyone but I knew I just knew I was supposed to do it Well, I couldn't figure it out and I couldn't get my wife and I to work out the logistics of how we would do it with our family and our schedule. So I gave up trying to do it. And actually, I was praying one morning, the first weekend of February. And as I was praying about it, I I was just praying, God, I, I feel you're calling me to do this, but I just, it's been over two years and I don't know what to do. And I felt very strongly that God was impressing in my heart to say, just surrender that to me and don't worry about it. And in my heart, I guess I kind of assumed like, I'm not going to do it at least before July 4th. So I went on. Then we made the very painful decision on April 17th to cancel our physical gathering for Claim Your Campus 2020. And that had been something that was a dream of mine for 10 years to do this event starting in 2010. And it was very difficult to surrender that and let it go. But, you know, it was meant to be where we had raised a million and a half dollars for this event. I mean, so we had invested so much time and money and it was just hard to let that go. And it's the year of. It's not like you still have two years out. There was a lot of plans and money spent for this event that was only months away. Yeah. I mean, that that was like a weekend of personal pain and anguish and and really a death of a dream. And so I, I mourned and wept that whole weekend. I just, just couldn't believe it, that we were losing everything. But the same night that we canceled it, I sat down with Ariana, my wife, and I said, I think, I'm, I think now is the time to do this walk. And she agreed. She said, I think it probably is. And so... Then from there, we started trying to figure out how we're going to do it. And there it became, okay, it's 660 miles. And I hadn't really physically prepared like 
a lot of people would to do it. I was running regularly at the time, but believe it or not, I learned that that's different than training to walk. <laughs> I thought, oh, I run, so that's even better. Endurance, yeah. Yeah, but it's actually quite a bit different. And then I started to figure out, okay, do I want to capture this or just do it alone or have other people? I had all these decisions to make about when am I going to do it and with who and how and mapping it out, all the logistics um, and figuring that out. So I got some people to help me. I got a guy that loves history. His name's Dan Chapin. He's a good friend. And he he said, I love history and I actually know about the Trail of Death already and let me help you map it out and I will we'll figure it out together. So we started doing that. And then, believe it or not, the week before, and, I, and I'd asked Nigel Big Pond just out of respect for him and, and the Native Americans, I asked him, should I try to capture this in some sort of you know, way for posterity and, and to help people know what the Trail of Death is? Because most people don't know about it. Or should I just do it as a, a very personal solo journey? And he encouraged me, along with some others, you need to tell the story about the Trail of Death. And there's a bigger thing happening here than just you and it. Somehow other people saw the connections with Kansas in our event. So that's when I decided, okay, I need to do this. And that came up so late in the game that it was literally, I was leaving on Sunday and I didn't have a film person. And so I reached out to somebody on Monday and then we met on Wednesday face to face and we don't live in the same city. So we had to coordinate meeting. And I shared this idea. I said, it's pretty raw. I don't know exactly what's going to happen, but I do feel like it's historic and I want to capture it. And so he came on board two days later on Friday, and then we left on that Sunday, which was wild. It all happened really fast. And I know just from my own experience of going backpacking for a week or you know, finding a trail and having to just plan periodically what to expect and gear and all that stuff. But this is a little bit different because you're walking a trail that occurred 170 years so. ago. Yeah, yeah, 170 years ago. So there's not really a trail the entire time. There's not a physical, like I just stay on this trail and just go for 600 miles. There's, there's parts of the trail that are road and parts of the trail that's hidden and parts of the trail that are not marked and so what was the difficulty or the challenges of just even planning it and mapping it out and how long to go somewhere because i remember you mentioning there's not even accommodations or a gas station for miles but you don't know that necessarily until you're actually walking the streets or the trail itself so i left on june 8th and uh, it was a Monday when I actually started walking from Indiana. And then I ended on the 28th. So it was 21 days of walking. So along with Dan's help and everything, my plan was to do kind of a hybrid. I didn't have enough time or training to do the entire trip, but I did a really good majority of it. So I walked 227 miles, 420,097 steps, <laughs> by the way in 21 days and so the first week I was totally solo and unsupported everything on my back and so you know, like you and I have we've backpacked and stuff so I had some of the gear I had to get a little bit more and I had some people just it was cool out of the blue just kind of donate a few hundred bucks so that I could get a couple of things I bought a couple pair of shoes and things like that interestingly enough I got my pack down to about 13, 14 pounds with everything for that week. And then the plan was that my wife and daughters would be there week two. And then week three would be guests. And that's when we would do most of the filming. So I'd already walked quite a bit when most of the filming occurred. And we decided to do it that way. And then the first week was, okay, I'll just kind of, I know my beginning and ending point but where I'll stay will kind of be up to the environment. And so <clears throat> there's a lot of crazy things that happen with that. You know, you're dodging weather. And the second day, there were 30 mile an hour headwinds walking into that the whole day. And so what I tried to do was walk as close as I could to 
where they walked that day, so where they started and where they ended. There's there's great journals and people have mapped everything, like where they started and where they ended. And there's monuments along the way that uh, some great people have organized. And a lot of Boy Scout troops between Indiana, Illinois, Missouri, and Kansas have actually put up these little monuments along the way of where they camped and what happened that day and people died and things like that. So I tried to do that, but I ended up sleeping in some pretty crazy, unexpected places that first week. It was pretty wild. How many miles per day were you walking approximately? Yeah, average was 12 to 15 miles a day. And the first day I walked what the Potawatomis walked, and that was 21 miles. And that was a huge day at the beginning to do that. It was 90 plus degrees almost every day that I walked. It was very hot, very humid. But I, I get to at least walk where they walk, and, and I can't by any means have experienced nearly what they did, of course. I mean, I've got shoes. Many of them didn't even have shoes. You know, not a lot of constant access to water. I mean, but it was something to at least be where they were and walk where they walked and really think about what they went through and what they experienced. I know from that first week that you were walking solo, it didn't really go as planned. I know your family came a week later with an RV and you kind of had a little bit more of a plan for where to stay. But that first week was kind of dicey on when to stay, where to stay, when to stop, all that stuff. Explain that a little bit. Well, I, you know, got going and then I had, you know, a little backpacker tent and all that stuff. I didn't carry a lot of food, actually. There's different, different um, philosophies on backpacking like this. Some is kind of take everything that you can be prepared for and the other more lean way is just take what you need and get food as you go which is what I did because I heard over and over you got to really be careful about um, you know the weight that you're carrying and your feet and blisters so I started getting foot issues three days in and it was toward the end of the third day and I was running out of daylight and it was starting to rain and I used my phone for digital maps and things and I kept looking for a place to stay and I couldn't find anyone and and all of a sudden I came along this building and I didn't know what it was on the map but it was a school and ironically enough um, I ended up kind of sneaking into this school at dusk and it was in the summer and they weren't in session and no one was there but I, I snuck in there and actually stayed under the bleachers of this school and some people, I think, saw me and were looking for me. And I was just very paranoid. And I felt kind of weird about being at a school. But I'm like, I, I got to have a place to stay. And my feet were falling apart at that point. The next day, I walked a little bit and got through about half of what I wanted to my mileage by 7.30 in the morning. I'd already, I got up at dusk and got a bunch of miles in. But I, I was in so much pain, I could barely walk. And so... I looked up this random church that was on the way. It was a few miles down the road, and I called them, and I said, hey, I'm looking for a place to stay, and they weren't open yet. They had a coffee shop, I called, and somebody at the coffee shop answered, and they said, let me have the pastor call you back when church opens. So a couple hours later, I got a call, and I said, hey, my name is Jeff Ecker, and I'm doing this walk, and he talked like he knew me, and come to find out later in the conversation, he did. I'd never met him before, but it was so weird, so... He took me in. I ended up staying there a couple nights because my feet were so bad. And he took me in and took care of me. And I had another person do that as well. This random couple that saw me on the road. And and they said, what are you doing? I've, we've seen you around here today. And it was a small little <laughs> town, you know, where nothing's going on. They, they just insisted. They said, you're staying in our place tonight. And I did. And they just showed me such hospitality. It just blew me away. So I had all these... Yeah, just crazy experiences along the way. And I'm sure you're going to mention this later or not, but just the perception of you have become a vagabond. You're just wandering panhandler type of person that people you've mentioned don't look you in the eye anymore. They have a completely different perception of of who you are. You're not this founder CEO. You are this homeless guy just wandering aimlessly through their backyard or something, you know, and 
How does all of that experience play into what the intent of doing the trail of death? I would stop and rest sometimes in people's yards because, you know, about every three to five miles, I would stop and just sit for a little bit, you know, and kind of try to just rest and take a load off. And I tried to be really discreet and not like get anybody's space. And we're talking about usually typically big farm yards. So I'm not like sitting in their front yard, yeah. you know, yeah. But uh, I had in the flower bed. Yeah, that's right. But I would stop at gas stations and definitely had people uh, treat me like I was homeless. I mean, you can, you can just catch the vibe because I've given that vibe. I know you don't look people in the eye. You think they're you feel maybe threatened or they're out to get something from you. Yeah. Anytime somebody approaches you, you already have a guard up of like, what do you want? Yeah. Am I going to have to turn you away? Yeah. Or be polite, but kind of in a kind word, say, hey, get away from me. Yeah. yeah. You're kind of dirty because, you know, you're just outside all day. Um, I actually hadn't trimmed my beard since COVID. And uh, I didn't really think much about it. I just was like, eh, I'm just going to let it grow, you know. So my beard was huge. And um, I was wearing this big straw hat because it was light and it was a great protection from the elements. But... That combination really made for an interesting looking uh, person. So here's one of the things that Keith Drury said to me that really stuck out to me. He said, having walked it, he said, you're going to know what it feels like to be poor. And I said, well, what's that mean? And he said, well, you're going to understand what it's like to be needy and in need. And you're going to need people's help more than what you think. And sometimes you'll get it and sometimes you won't. And he said, this is what Christ did, by the way. He left. He goes, Jeff, you're rich back home. You've got everything. You don't have to worry about food. You have a place to stay. You're rich in that sense. But he said, when you're here, you're not. You left everything behind. He goes, That's, he goes, isn't that interesting? That's what Christ did. Christ left everything. And I even get the chills now talking about it. It just opened up my understanding of what Christ did for us and what he left. And, and yeah, I mean, man, I obviously can't even begin to compare myself, but... But at least I got a little bit of a taste of leaving behind the comforts of home to be in need for sure. And, you know, like we joked about earlier, like this last weekend, I got recognized somewhere and by a student, you know, that's familiar with Never the Same. But like here I am now kind of being ostracized by some. It was really a, a, an experience that was definitely changed my perspective on people. With that perspective and how we operate as an organization and we really are for the youth ministry and the youth leader and, and students, really we wanting to transfer faith from one generation to the next. How does what you've experienced and what you went through, how does that tie into youth ministry? Well, all the time we talk about this here on the podcast and never the same and in personal conversations is that when you work with students quite often you're working with the symptoms of a larger issue so the biggest quote unquote problem students that we might work with generally that doesn't happen just within them usually there's something going on deeper in their life and almost without exception it's something happening at home with their parent or guardian and Someone shared something with me that shed light on why this walk for me really mattered. And they said, if you don't allow God to transform your sin, it will be transmitted on to the next generation. So if it's not transformed, it's transferred, it's transmitted. And that really struck me because I, this walk, I didn't quite understand everything and I'm still... God still, I believe, unraveling layers about this whole thing for me. But that injustice of moving those Native Americans, it, it was something that in our society that it got transferred. You know, that, that was, I feel like the Native American issue was not dealt with nearly as much as the African American issue. And that's still not resolved either. But we did go to war over that issue. I don't think we ever really began to at all to face in many ways the Native American issue nationally. And both of those are, are major unresolved things right now. What happened with the Native Americans, what happened to the African Americans. So all that to say for students and what we do, we have to understand that for students themselves, 
if they don't allow God to transform the sin in their life, they will transfer it on. I mean, there's that's biblical, right? That God talks about, you know, our sins in Jeremiah 32 will fall into the laps of our children if they're not dealt with. And, you know, we see that throughout Old and New Testament. It's a principle. And working with parents, we, we can see when we work with their students, if we know the families, we can directly see that passing on that transference and transmittance of sin uh, and some sin patterns and cycles. So it really it really matters so much. And reading and learning about the trail of death, here's what's interesting, Jason, is that there were kind of three modes of thought about what to do with Native Americans back then. There was the the far right, I mean, this would be the extreme version, would be to eliminate the Native Americans because they were just in the way. And they were, some, unfortunately, looked at them as subhuman. The further left or more progressive view at that time was to make them like us. So let's educate them and make them like us as European settlers so that we can bring them up to speed so they're not, you know, behind the times anymore. And the moderate view, interestingly enough, at that time was to not eliminate them and to not make them like us, to allow them to be themselves, but to just move them out of the way. So let's just not touch their culture, but let's move them west. And so they did that. And that was the that was the compromise. And, you know, as I've thought about our issues today, the compromise always seems good, but even the compromise can be evil. And that compromise was an evil one. It was an evil one to say, well, we're just going to move them so that they're out of our way. And even how we sometimes we want to come to a compromise because of inconvenience. And we don't want to deal with the inconvenience. We want to compromise. And like you said, that compromise can still be considered evil. But we see that now of like the hindsight of history and and we we place the standard of things that we know now to 200 years ago, 400 years ago, and yet people were making decisions back then based on what they knew or where they were at or the compromises that they had to come to. But we can look at it and go, no, that's still evil. Like what you did was still evil. And it may be inconvenient, you know, for them to have the Native Americans in their way of progress and development and you go, this is the right thing to do because we're not killing them and they can still be who they want to be. But we can look back and go, that was still wrong. And we have to deal with that. And what's happening today, what's interesting about right now is a lot of evil is getting exposed and it is being uh, understood for what it is. But I, I still believe that there are things that, just like this issue then in in the 18, you know, mid 1800s in the United States it was outside out of mind well we'll just move them out west and then because you didn't see them you didn't think about them they were it was like okay we dealt with that we're done and today there's I think there's a lot of out of sight out of mind things I think um, knowing that 60 million babies have been extinguished we don't think about that every day what that would look like that one third of our student population would be filling our schools and communities and youth ministries, you know, it's out of sight, out of mind and out of convenience, right? Out of, it's an inconvenience to people that child in the womb. So out of convenience, we'll take care of it out of sight, out of mind. Yeah. And I think years from now, generations from now, we'll look back and say, that's still evil. Yes. Even though we think that compromise is the right decision of our time. Yeah. And then porn's the same way, you know, you look at porn and you go, okay, I looked at it, but you don't realize the ripple effect, the chain reaction before what leads up to things like porn and it being produced and then what leads after it. So when you participate in that, you're part of this chain reaction that's happening and there's a lot of layers to it, but I, I'd say the other thing, the last thing I would say, Jason, about how's it tied to youth ministry is for me, it helped me understand how we marginalize people today in so many of the same ways. And, and I do the same thing, but people that have certain beliefs, you know, obviously there's still issues with 
racism and people just skin color and culture differences really they get marginalized and treated as differently but also belief systems ideals you know right now we're so partisan that we we get really upset and we just rage over people with different beliefs so stupid things like masks or political affiliations or what what uh, flag do i have flying in my you know my vehicle or at my home and you know type what, of straw you use yeah yeah or what you know what yard sign that you might have and so we we just treat people as less than human and what i began to really see in a brand new way on this walk was the image of god in a person is the most profound and beautiful thing that we could see keith jury has hiked over 10,000 miles in his life and People would say to him, isn't it amazing to be out in creation? You see the mountains and the meadows and lakes and streams and trails, and you see God's creation. How amazing is that? And his response is, the most beautiful part of God's creation is people. And that stuck with me. you know. There, and, and I will speak to this way as a lot of like Christians. We get so um, energized about caring for the environment and making sure that it's safe. And I'm there. You know, I'm I'm with people on that. At the same time, we devalue people and what how we talk about them and what we do. And man, what a dichotomy! What a what what hypocrisy that we have! That the the pinnacle of all creation, another person that may disgust us, and we treat them accordingly. And man, that is the most anti-christian thing that we can do or using the term you used earlier subhuman we look at somebody who may believe something different and think they are subhuman and that's still wrong regardless well in the next segment we are going to continue jeff's story and the trail of death and and hit upon more of the emotional impact and some of the the discoveries that you had personally for you so please join us in the next segment well i'm joined here in the studio with my co-host jeff eckert we have been talking about his experience with the trail of death prayer walk uh, that he went through for three weeks a journey but also discussing some of the outcomes, some of the experiences, some of the things that he went through, preparing it, uh, and even just the experiences on the trail. And I want to ask you, before you left, you had some guidelines of what you wanted to hold yourself to. What are those guidelines? I decided on this walk, basically over the month of June, to really cut myself off from the world in terms of current events, media, music, any outside influences. What I what I wanted to do was I wanted to be in the moment where I was in terms of I wanted to be hearing the voice of God. I wanted to be feeling the breeze and hearing it and hearing the sound of the birds and hearing the environment that I was in and not hearing about the latest news cycle story and uh, what was happening or trending on social media, which which you did miss a period of time where riots were happening, monuments were falling. There was racial tension that was just bubbling and you were not aware of any of this. Yeah, that was that was what was crazy is that towards the at the end, you know, I I was able to catch up a little bit and it was funny because even when you cut yourself off from current events they can in our world they can just find you and they did find me a little bit even though I tried to so people would say hey do you know this is happening and um, one of the one of the really contrasting things was you know later hearing in detail about all the monuments that were falling during that time when I was visiting these monuments by myself out in the middle of nowhere that no one even knew about that that was memorializing these beautiful people that had died most of them children on on this trail so 
I said um, no social media and um, very, very limited contact with the world. And that that guideline, and the other thing is I said, I'm only going to listen to two musical playlists during the whole time. And I asked my kids, I, I want you to make two playlists. One was called uh, Take a Walk. And that was, uh, I said, I want two. I want like kind of a worship God-focused playlist. And then I want, I need my 80s. I just got to have it or something, you know. And <laughs> so that one was called uh, I Would Walk 500 Miles right, is what yeah. my kids named it, which is a it's great a, old song mm, from the... It's a valid 90s. title. Yeah, yeah. So um, so I only listened to that, and that just cleared my mind. I've told people how amazing it was that my mind was completely free. and And even to this day, I consume media completely differently than I did then by cutting myself off and I and I, when I would share that with people they'd go wow I wish I could do that or that must be so cool almost as if well I could never do that but I tell people I'd really highly recommend it because I think what I didn't realize about that particular guideline is how much I would say it, it tainted is probably the best word that it tainted my perspective on the world even even and Jason you know me but I'm a very, um, what I would consider a critical thinker about when a story comes out, I've, I'm really scrutinizing it for its slant and its bias and the truth that may or may not be there. And so I tend to, I think, be that way already, but, but it, it just helped me to think and pray and feel so much clear about things. And even during this time when there are so many fighting for justice and rightly so, of of how people have been treating people, and and yet you find yourself on this trail, also in your own way, fighting for justice. You are fighting for justice through prayer, seeking God and saying, God, things in the past have been wrong, and we need healing. And but these two things coincided without you even realizing. You leave you. You disconnect from all of the media, all the plans uh, that culture kind of wraps themselves around, and you're seeking God for justice for people. There is a difference between justice and vengeance, and sometimes we get that mixed up, especially in general society. I think we often um, can mistake the two. I think where we got to be super careful, as I'm speaking as a believer here, as a Christ follower, that we start to take on justice with our own end in mind. And what I mean by that is we seek vengeance instead of justice. We we want to pay people back. And and that's not I mean scripture is very clear about that, you know. I mean God says vengeance is mine. And so we seek justice and not vengeance. And you see that in scripture. You see where people try to take justice in their own hands. We see that in the Gospel of Luke where the disciples say to Jesus Hey, do you want us to basically take matters in our own hands against the Samaritans? And, and he's like, no, no, you guys don't even know what you're talking about. This, You're talking about vengeance, and I'm talking about God's true justice. And that lies in his hands. And so this walk really forced me to say, everyone's like screaming for justice, but some are acting out in vengeance. And so... What was really very counterintuitive and, and I would say very countercultural is to go low and to be quiet. In terms of going low, just disappearing, so to speak, from the conversation with people horizontally and going vertical. And that's what I attempted to do, and that's what I did do for those 21 days is to go vertical and say, God, I'm here with you. I want to understand justice from your perspective. I want to honor the people that were marginalized from the past. Part of that connects to my family personally. And I know many of us in the United States have native blood in us, some more than others, but I wanted to connect with that a little bit. And also to know that, you know, to try to get a sense of God's heart for everything, to get a feel of what he was thinking then and how he's feeling now about things. And that that was um, actually really painful. One of the things that I experienced that I wasn't prepared for was how difficult it would be emotionally and spiritually to do this. And 
Keith Drury warned me about that. He said, this is going to be really hard to do because you're going to be thinking about death all day, every day. Now, for some context, Jason, when I was in college one summer, I worked at a, at the morgue for the city of Indianapolis. So you know what dead people look like. I do, because we oh, had a good. morgue right there, and and so I worked around death all that summer, and it messed with me. It I had dreams about death. I thought about death all the time. And actually, in a weird way, that was a really good thing, because thinking about your own mortality can be a really healthy thing. And so I thought about that. But I cried every day on this trip. Every single day I wept at some at really strange, weird times. Um, and so it was very emotionally heavy, and I was really kind of separated and felt really alone out there. And even when other people around me just couldn't really express the loneliness and the isolation of being like, immersed in that world where I was thinking so much about the pain. And honestly, the first uh, 10 days, every step, there was a physical pain attached to it. And it took that long to really get over that where every step wasn't very difficult to do. And so there there were um, a lot of vulnerabilities that I felt out there. And I don't know if you're willing to go a little bit deeper in in the vulnerability, I know this is a personal uh, thing as well, what you were experiencing internally and how difficult it can be to even talk about it, but would you be willing to maybe express a little bit more of, of some of those feelings that you went through? One of the most vulnerable pieces for me was that I was walking towards Kansas and every step I thought I'm getting closer to this huge disappointment and the disappointment was claim your campus 2020 and if if you're friends of ours of this podcast or of me and jason personally of our ministry you know what we were shooting for this large gathering that we wanted to see this moment for this generation where we had invested years and hundreds of thousands of dollars that were raised and time and travel and fatigue and hopes and dreams and ideals and momentum and people watching this and and being a part of partnering with all these organizations and believing that this was a moment and just feeling so many amazing miraculous confirmations leading up to this and then it all just crumbled and all of a sudden now I go from July 4th weekend being maybe what I thought going into it this might be the greatest weekend and event and moment of my career and as a person like everything that I'd been pointed towards for 10 years and now I'm by myself walking in 90 degree heat and my body is aching and I feel terrible and I'm discouraged and I'm thinking I've got to go to this field in Kansas that I don't really want to go to anymore where really a a dream is dead Yes. It, essentially, like what you've been dreaming about for 10 years. And as long as this organization has been officially developed, uh, you are now walking towards that disappointment, that, that dream that is no longer going to be fulfilled. And so what was originally the intent of the walk leading up to the event and whether, you know, timing wise, all that stuff, but it was supposed to be ahead of time to lead to something that was supposed to be a pinnacle of your career is now you're starting to go, this is, this is awful. I'm walking towards something that is non-existent and reminding you of the, the pain of this broken dream. I had this romanticized, I had these romanticized versions in my mind of what this could be like. And my first romantic version of this was I would do this walk and I would stroll into this field in Kansas and we'd have the event and I would be there and it would be like this ending of this journey into this like climactic moment of victory. And then when the event was changed and physically we canceled it, then it all of a sudden, the maybe the more romanticized version is like, well, I get to go out and experience this adventure and to be with God and just to clear my mind. 
and try to move past all the disappointment. But what that turned into was all the pain, the literally all the blisters and the aches. And, you know, I got back and, and uh, I went to a chiropractor and they just looked at my legs because I just wanted to have everything checked over from this trip. And they said, you've got over 50 muscle knots in your legs. That romantic part of it, like, went out the door day one. It really did. And then I was like, man, am I going to be able to do this? And this is really hard. And physically, emotionally, spiritually, in every way, it was so difficult. And that feeling um, just grew in intensity till it got to a point where, Jason, like three days before the end, I was so disillusioned. And I was like, God, I don't know what I, why I did this. I believe that in my heart you called me to do it, but this just doesn't make sense, and I'm just ready to be done with it. And you and I are both, we have ran marathons, so we know how to train. We've leading up to that moment of exhilaration of crossing the finish line. Yeah. And you don't have that. Like, that's what gets you through the training. That's what gets you through the 26.2 miles of just the finish line of being a great experience. But you did not have that because the finish line was, it wasn't going to be a dream fulfilled. Yeah, it was. And it, it just, it, it drove me to really a despair where I just, three days before I got done and I said, all right, God, like you have to show me something here. You have to help me understand this because I don't know if I can even finish this and go on because this just, it never totally made sense, but I'm just so burned out with pain and frustration and disappointment and discouragement that I'm just done. And I, and I really said, God, I need you to give me a sign. Cause I just didn't feel like I could go one more step. I know we mentioned some of the, the crazy experiences that you went through, uh, not only just physically the people that you've met, but what were some of the memorable ones, um, with the people along the way? I was walking one day and, um, just all kind of crazy things happen. Like actually the first day of my walk, I was walking and I stopped at this little, um, like drive up 50 style restaurant and I was checking it out to see if it was open cause I was hungry and I heard a screeching noise and I turned around and, and literally like 10 feet away from where I was standing, I saw this motorcycle screech to a halt and T-bone a pickup truck and the motorcycle driver was wearing, um, a polo shirt, short sleeve shorts, uh, some kind of like boat shoes or something like that with no socks and no helmet. And Man. I saw that like 10 feet away from me and it's like, Ooh, that, that was memorable. I'm a motorcycle rider, you know, and that freaked me out. The dude got up and walked away by the way, which was crazy. I was stopped and, and all of a sudden a, a state police pulled up and then two County police and they asked me what I was doing very suspiciously and you know this was right after George Floyd and so things were really on edge and uh, you know I'm a white guy so it's a little bit different but I said uh, I just got my ID out right away because he said started me asking questions hey what are you doing today where are you headed and I told him and and he kept probing further he's like where are you going and I said well I'm going to Logansport which is just a few miles up the road and he goes, boy, you got a lot of, you seem like you're, you got a lot of stuff with you to do that. You know, like he could tell it was like a long distance walker. And I said, well, I'm actually going to Kansas. And then he, you know, got, piqued his interest and got suspicious. He's like, well, what are you doing in Kansas? And I just kind of laughed. I go, well, I'm actually on a, this long prayer walk on the, on the trail of death. And he kind of looked at me like I was crazy. And he goes, well, we've gotten calls from a bunch of people in the area about this strange looking man in a straw hat. And uh, I haven't seen him. Yeah, I was like, I don't know where he is. <laughs> That's right. I should have said that. I, I needed you with me for the quick uh, response. So, um, you know, he came up and then all of a sudden two other police. So I had three policemen there checking me out while I'm just sitting on the side of the road. And I thought to myself, I wonder if I was a different skin color, what this would be like. It probably, you know, I don't want to assume, but it could have been definitely a lot different. Um, people taking me in people encouraging me um like i said you know being overlooked and uh 
treated like homeless. Yeah, treated like a homeless guy. A lot of crazy things. And uh, walking on the side of roads sometimes that literally was just the edge of the road on the stripe and, you know, almost getting hit. I mean, lots of lots of crazy things, dodging weather and rain and, you know, the elements, the heat. There was a, a lot of crazy experiences. You mentioned about three days out from when you were scheduled to end. You were just kind of crying out to God, like, you know, why and what's the whole point of all of this. And But you made a discovery, a startling discovery at the end of your walk. Uh, what was that discovery? It was the same morning, three days before the end, when I prayed and said, "God, I'm I'm done with this. This is doesn't make any sense." And I don't, you know, I was kind of even a little embarrassed. I'm like, "Man, I did this whole thing, but it just, you know, is, is this all there is? It just didn't seem seem like there was something missing." And rather than taking paper maps, people have um, created these Google Maps. Uh, documents that have the turn by turn that you print off right yeah <laughs> not quite well it got me into trouble because I was using digital maps and versions but there are a couple places there are big stretches in Illinois where I didn't get cell service so I really it really threw me for a loop and I had to figure out other ways to to get my route but while I was you know towards the end three days before the end I'm looking at the detailed Google Docs and the maps and Like we said at the beginning, this thing ends in Osawatomie, Kansas, the Trail of Death. And our event was in Lacine, Kansas, was just a few miles as the crow flies, you know, straight across there. And I was looking at the detailed map, which I hadn't really, I didn't really look detailed just a day or two ahead, you know, so I could stay focused. Because I usually tried to memorize the route in the morning so I didn't have to keep going back to my phone in case I didn't have signal or whatever. Who knows what could happen out there, but... I looked at the detailed map that night uh, that I'd prayed in the morning and just out of just complete discouragement. And I noticed this crazy thing I'd never seen before. So when the Indiana militia was ending this trip, they ended in Osawatomie, and that's where historically we know from their journals and all the records they were left. But when they got to Osawatomie, the one thing I know from the historical versions is that the United States agent was supposed to meet them in Kansas. He wasn't there. So there's some speculation. But in the detailed maps, they go further south and east, and then they make kind of a, a circle, a loop, and then they go back north again to Osawatomie and then end. So they get to Osawatomie, they do this loop that's about 20 miles, and then they go back to this town and then leave them and I looked at that map and I'm like I've never seen this before and then I saw where they went and they actually go exactly to the field where we were holding our event in Lacine so in 1838 this tribe of Potawatomies goes right to this field in Kansas in Lacine where we're going to host Claim Your Campus 2020 never seen that before And there's a lot that happened as a result of that that triggered some things. But initially and immediately, I knew God was saying, that's for you. I held that for this moment so that you could know you're on the right track. Now finish your last three days strong. Yeah, that's quite the circle that's getting completed, basically, in all of what's happening, what has happened, your walk, what you are praying for, and to have that sign from God of like, at that moment, it just shows God's provision that he cares uh, when we are in the darkest place as well, because you'd probably admit that that was a dark moment for you. And, mm-hmm. and when your mind is playing this this game, really, of how low can you go and get yourself really discouraged, uh, God was able to come through and, and say, no, I'm still with you, and there's still a purpose behind this. And you mentioned that something happened as a result of that. Talk to us about that. What came of of this discovery? Th- this is an interesting thing because I've never talked publicly about this, just with you know a handful of people. But uh, one of my friends was with me at the end, and he noticed that in Osawatomie, I had a group of about 30 people that walked the last five miles on uh, June 28th. 
And when we got to the end, it says this is where the trail of death ends. And then right next to it, right next to that last trail of death monument is a sign that talks about John, the battle of Osawatomie and John Brown. Now, earlier when we talked about you know, the difference between vengeance and justice. John Brown is one of the most fascinating characters in American history because in the 1850s, he got he got really frustrated and impatient with um, the slavery issue. He wanted to seek justice for the, for the African Americans, and it wasn't happening quick enough, or in his version at all. Now, he was a Christian. He was a believer. But he started these this revolt, and he really... If there's a single man I would point to, in my opinion, that was a catalyst for the Civil War in the United States, it would be John Brown. Crazy enough, in 1856, I believe, it's 55 or 56, I think it's 56, he, what, his first revolt was in Osawatomie. Now, here's what's weird, is that that was the same place where the Trail of Death is. So, fast forward to 2020. In 2020, we're seeing riots and racial unrest and this you know, this um, groaning in our country, in our culture about injustice. And here you have this little town where both of these major sins of our past intersect. The sin of how the Native Americans were treated and then the African Americans. Both in this little bitty town in the middle of nowhere in Kansas, Osawatomie, Kansas. And so my friend, two days after the walk was over, he called me. And he had come to walk with me, and then he flew back home, and he said, Hey, did you notice the John Brown sign? And I said, Yeah, I didn't really pay attention much to it. And he goes, I think there's something here. Well, the Battle of Osawatomie was on August 30th, 1856. He said, I believe that there may be something that needs to happen on August 30th. He said, I think we need to do a gathering in that field. There's a connection here. There's God's doing something. And I was at a place of such you know, exhaustion and disappointment, I said, man, that's a great idea. I hope you have a good time. (laughs) And I was like, it's awesome, but I just can't be a part of it. And he said, well, I think you're meant to be a part of it. Well, then this national circle of leaders came around me and said, Jeff, there's something here. We need, we need to seek God together about this. Over the next few weeks we did. And I told those guys, I go, man, this is amazing, but I'm exhausted, I'm broke, I'm emotionally spent, I'm spiritually really broken right now. I just can't really lead anything. And yet, God was faithful in their conversations and in my conversation with the Lord and saying, there's something here. Now, what was crazy is, this is the first time I've talked about this publicly here, but on August 30th, we did hold the sacred prayer gathering. Jason, you were there, our team was there. 650 of us from around the country were there, and we gathered in that field in Lacine in secret. We didn't promote it on social media. We asked everyone not to forward the emails. We created a website that was password protected. It was only word of mouth uh, that people knew about it, and it wasn't there. It wasn't a rally or a protest. It was really a prayer meeting, and it was sacred. It was what I would call a prayer closet. Uh, a community prayer closet moment where we didn't tell any of the outside where we told one don't post this on social media don't live stream it we don't want people to spoil it interrupt it or misunderstand it and so we gathered together on that field and for five hours we we went vertical with God and we dealt with the sins of our past we dealt with innocent bloodshed in our history and I will tell you that as a result of that Things are happening within the United States government up to the highest levels um, that are bringing about some admissions and some acknowledgement of the sins of our past and and the shedding of innocent blood. And it will be historic if it continues. That shedding of innocent blood specifically was the Native American, the African American, and the unborn child yes there was some confirmation that those were the three things that we were drawn to pray about in seeking healing in the history of our country and the fallen nature of man but played out in these three areas and um, really that event was uh, taking that business to God and and seeking forgiveness seeking healing uh, reconciliation 
it was powerful. It was, it was very momentous. I think it was the most significant moment in my life up to this point. And what's so interesting in our world, you know, is anything legitimate if no one talks about it on online or social media and no one talked about this event. And those of you listening, you probably don't even know about this. No one ever said anything before really or since. And there's a lot that I'm not saying here on purpose about, you know, what happened there, but it it was a miraculous day. And it was truly a day where almost like a a court scene. and, And we see this represent Psalm 50 where God summoned people from the nation together and said, okay, we've got some things to deal with. And I really believe Jason this, and I don't say this lightly that what we dealt with on August 30th, I really believe in God's economy. We dealt with the sin of the past and I believe, and we're seeing all lots of different signs now of freedom that God is releasing um, some of the judgment and I'm not saying it was the be-all, end-all of moments, but there's no question from what we've seen that it was a breakthrough spiritually for, I believe, the history of our nation. And what I love about it is that um, it, it's a great reminder for me that when God deals with us, we just tend to go horizontal. We tend to go, well, I'm going to talk about this on social media, or I'm going to invite people into the conversation. And this was a private conversation that we all had with God on that day, and no one else knew about it. And God knows the motives of our heart. It wasn't there to pander or to protest or politicize. It was purely a prayer moment, and it was powerful. Or even to portray our success, uh, portray our own identity, portray something that we could have easily pushed through as well. Like, look at what we're doing. It was none of that. It was all void of that. The motives were completely focused on God, we have sin to deal with and we are, we're broken. And there was a lot of genuine hearts approaching God with just this, the sin of the past and saying, we need to, we need to deal with this. And yeah, it was a very, uh, like I said, powerful quote unquote event. We're taking care of business and, and, uh, seeking God for it. You know, out of that, we did film uh, parts of this walk, and um, there's some really great moments with some friends. And so we're also working on, uh, with the streaming service, a docu-series that will come out about this where we'll explore the trail of death, but also its tie into today. So the beginning of the episode was the audio. If you're interested in learning more about this um On my personal Facebook page, I posted the link to that particular video trailer that uh, shows where this docuseries is going to go. You can find it on Vimeo. If you just look up Trail of Death, you can find it. Uh, Also, on my Instagram, I I posted every day. I did go on and did an online journal during that prayer walk about what was happening each day and how that tied in with the trail of death and some of my experiences and some of the imagery of, of that experience. And so, you know, uh, if you look me up at Jeff Eckert on Instagram, you can see if you're interested in learning more, but it's really good for me to be able to share some of these things publicly for the first time about what it was like and how God moved in my own heart during this time of upheaval. And I hope that it was an encouragement. The Thought Factory podcast is brought to you by Never the Same, whose vision is to see new generations transformed in Christ to further the kingdom of God. Learn more at neverthesame.org.